Hello and welcome to the Lose Weight, Feel Great Summit. I'm your host, Joanna Peterson, and I created this summit to share with you how a healthy lifestyle can transform your life. I am so excited and thrilled today to have with us Dr. Keisha. She's going to be so much fun. Dr. Keisha is the founder of the Academy of Integrative Medicine. She is an integrative medicine expert, doctor of sexology, psychotherapist, a board certified functional medicine provider, Ayurvedic practitioner, medicine woman, best selling author, speaker, and a mother of four. Did I miss anything? <laughs> <laughs> you are amazing. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. This is uh, such a great platform you've created to help people really get underneath these things from all viewpoints. Thank you. Um, I, well, tell me a little bit more about you in the audience and how you get into the health and wellness field. Okay, so, you know, I think anyone that we meet in this in this circle is going to have their own story, right? And uh, that's definitely true for me. Uh, when I was when I was uh, 19, I graduated with my nursing license, so I was an RN, and I worked uh, gradually into more higher and higher intensity kinds of environments until I was in the ICU and um, working in the hospice, and I just loved these, I loved, I ran marathons, I was very high achiever, very productivity oriented, drove myself, I was such a perfectionist. And then when I was 30, I got very sick, and this is how my patients describe it too, where they say, all of a sudden I got sick, you know, and that is how I experienced it, but of course that's not how it happened. But one morning I woke up, and the day before I'd been training for a marathon, and the next day I had 10 pounds of just puffy, puffy weight all over me. And it was like someone had taken the batteries out of the Energizer Bunny. I had no energy. I was completely flattened. And I thought, wow, and I was in pain. My joints were red and inflamed and swollen and my hands were, it was just this like, what has gone on with my body? And so I got in to see a doctor and I was diagnosed with a terminal illness, really, an incurable disease that's autoimmune called rheumatoid arthritis. And when the doctor took my history, she found out that I, when she asked had I had any autoimmune disease in my family, I said, yeah, I think my grandfather had rheumatoid arthritis. He died before I was born in his, I think he was actually my age right now, I'm 54. And he was in the wheelchair for a while, like really badly debilitated from rheumatoid arthritis. And so she said, okay, well, here are two prescriptions. And she said, when you get worse, not if you get worse, come back and we'll increase them and or give you some, some more. And I said, well, hang on just a second. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you know like I'm very disciplined person and I will like I can change my diet I can do whatever I need to exercise wise and she said uh, no nope, you know you just happen to draw the short straw of the genetic lottery right and and that's kind of like close the book put it on the shelf you're done and this is the life that you get to lead for the rest of your life from the age 30 forward right and I was on my way home thinking about that. And I thought, there has to be a different way. There just has to be. And so I always tell audiences when I speak from stages, like I would never, at that time in my life, I would not have known an herb if it had bitten me in the butt. Like I, was, I would not, I was purely Western medicine. And so, you know, I started going home and researching on the computer and I found some science that linked positive results with yoga and autoimmune disease. So I thought, okay. And I found a place that there was a yoga class about five miles away from me. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go to yoga tomorrow. And I remember calling my running partner and saying, I've never hung out with people that chant before. I'm a little nervous. You know, I mean, that's how conservative I was. I, I was just so conservative. And she said, oh, and I said, you know, and you have to remember, this is also a time before there was a yoga studio on every corner by Starbucks, right? That wasn't like that. And, and then I said, and I don't even know, frankly, if I can touch my own toes, you know, because I was such a hardcore runner. 
And so I, this is what was so funny. Like the next day I actually got up and I ran five miles to my yoga class. I took a 90 minute power vinyasa class for my very first yoga class because I didn't know, I didn't know what the difference was, right? Mm -hmm. And then I ran five miles home. <laughs> that was how hard I was on my body. I was just not compassionate at all. And always kind of thinking of it as a secondary thing. Like it needed to be tamed. It needed to be, you know, really beaten into submission. Mm -hmm. And so I was a complete sugar addict and, you know, I, I would have like three brownies and then run 10 miles the next day. Right. That's how that's called exercise anorexia, by the way, which I didn't even know at the time. I just thought I was so healthy. So when it came time for me to make some changes, yoga, in that first class, the yoga teacher said the word Ayurveda. And I remember he said just enough that I went home and I looked again on the computer for this word. And it made so much sense to me because 10,000 years ago, Ayurveda is the medical arm of yoga. They actually realized something that we don't still know in our own medical paradigm, which is that we're all different. Mm -hmm. We're all different. And that's so funny to sound like that was so revolutionary to me. <laughs> it was like the clouds parted and the angels sang. And I saw a whole bunch of patients from my past that had died in the ICU. And I all of a sudden understood why. Like, oh, that's because, you know, because we always try to treat everybody the same. We give them the same medication, same, you know. Yeah. And so, and then we expect for things to be different to be the same standardized, right? And we don't expect there to be a different outcome. And that's why we have so many medical lawsuits. So it was really this very interesting shift for me. And the other thing that I read is that autoimmune disease is undigested anger. And I remember thinking, I'm not an angry person, you know? And, and I just remember thinking like being kind of pissy about that. And, and just thinking, well, how can they say that? You know, like everybody with autoimmune disease has undigested anger. And sure enough, of course, my very response was angry. <laughs> and what I now know about everyone with autoimmune disease is that we're people pleasers, we're perfectionists, and we carry poison from past pain, hurt, emotional. And you know that's that's been the case for every one of my patients. And as soon as I healed all that up, I got rid of my sugar addiction. I got rid of my rheumatoid arthritis, never to have it again. If then six months, it was gone. And you know that was 24 years ago. I was able to begin to set boundaries with myself and others, and then to actually begin to get into a collaborative, loving, compassionate relationship with my body. Because one of the things Ayurveda taught me also was that we have five different layers to us. We have our physical layer, we have our energy body, we have our emotional body, our mental body, and then our, what they call your bliss sheet, the Nandamaya Kosha. And that is like a portal into all collective consciousness. And so that's the place where we have all of our great ideas and our epiphanies and we feel real joy. And we all want access to that all the time. But if we're toxic in any of these other layers, as in emotionally toxic, mentally toxic, spiritually toxic, you know, then, then we're not going to have access to that. So I began to understand the depth of the level of toxicity that I had, which we can go into, but, you know, I, I started to learn how to meditate and I started really getting quiet with my, with myself. And then really starting to examine things that I, saw, I thought were true with a capital T and, and saying, oh, I see. And I would, I'd watch that T kind of fall apart and, and drift away. And one day this word autoimmune started floating in front of me and my third eye. And I just remember looking at it and watching it. And then I realized, oh, auto, that means I'm attacking myself. Mm -hmm. Oh, Oh, so that means I'm killing myself, actually. So why am I attacking myself? Why am I committing suicide in what we would think of as a societally acceptable way? When is the first time I wanted to die? And that was like this really important question for me to ask myself. So I started going back and following this little golden breadcrumb of tra you know, trail of memories. And 
I landed on this 10 year old little girl version of myself who was being sexually abused at the elementary school by the vice principal. And I remember looking at that little girl with my observer's mind and, and watching her and thinking, ah, oh, she wanted to die. She wanted to die in the most profound way. She didn't know why this world was so unsafe and why adults weren't there to protect children and couldn't, couldn't really understand what was happening. She really wanted to die. And so I really understood like, oh, my cells got that message at the age of 10 and 20 years later, all they were doing was acquiescing to that desire. And, you know, we have science to back that up now, but we now know it takes anywhere from 10 to 30 years to actually develop a full-blown disease, that it takes all this time for your cells to have that messaging, and then it happens. Mm -hmm. So really understanding that I made up a meaning about that event when I was 10 with a brain that wasn't fully developed yet, you know, that's what we do as children. We have these very wise minds, but they don't have an adult frontal cortex yet. The impulse control and the executive function is not online until we're actually 26 years old. And so in those moments that we have these experiences that we can't explain, whether we fail a test or we don't get picked for a, a sporting event or we get left out at the, in the cafeteria or on the playground, you know, we all have, every child has events that they can't explain that are painful. Mm -hmm. And we'll make up a meaning about that event or that time period. And from that meaning, we actually create a belief with a capital B. And we make that a capital T truth for ourselves, you know, because it's absolute truth in that moment with the mind that we have at that moment. And then we start creating an adaptive behavioral strategy to go with that belief. So just for an example, when I was 10, when the intercom would go off in the classroom for the Pledge of Allegiance every morning, I, lived, I was a Navy brat. And so we would get up and we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, right? But every single time that intercom would go off, I would go into fight or flight because, and freeze because that's how I got called to the principal's office. So every single time the thing would crackle to life, I'd go into this mm -hmm. like fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it would be to call me down to the office. So what I was being told by the vice principal was that I was a bad kid. I was, I was like one of two white kids in the whole school and I was, I was called a bad white trash kid. And so I thought I began to be like, I must be doing something wrong here. Right. And so the meaning I made up is that first of all, I'm not safe. And that was true. And the belief I created from it was I have to be perfect to even survive. Like perfectionism became my adaptive behavior that I was still doing, you know, as a young nurse and as a marathon runner and as a mother, you should have seen what I used to do as a super mom. It's craziness, you know? And so when I think about that decade of adulthood right there, I had carried that, that 10 year old belief and that behavior and meaning up into my adult life. And it was literally killing me. And so what the beauty of rheumatoid arthritis was for me was to be able to sit down, learn new skills, right? Mm -hmm. And then say, oh, that happened then. And I still believe it's true today. And it's not. And I get to reframe this and do something new with it and heal this trauma and then go forward with oh, I'm actually worthy and deserving of all the love and life that the universe has to offer and that the perfection is actually in the imperfection and all the things that you hear people say, but I really got it, right? I could really embody it. So that's how I came to do what I do today. I started, I went back to graduate school and I, I got a master's in Ayurvedic medicine and I, I did all these things because I thought, you know what, hospice, the, the work I was doing in death and dying was actually the best medical care that we have in our country <laughs> because we start addressing spirituality and we, we take the whole family system into consideration and emotional and mental and spiritual health are all part of the dynamic. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to start practicing medicine in a way that brings that to the front end you know, and, and that we don't have to have a terminal illness for us to start reevaluating what's, what's important for us. So that's my story. 
Oh, I love it. Isn't that amazing? With uh, with um, with the trauma comes always a gift, right? Always. Always. So this is how. If you're willing, mm -hmm. right? If if you take it and you and you live in a victimization place and you stay there stuck then the gift is not there. But if you're willing to self confront and go, Oh, what's the post traumatic growth I can have from this, right? Then yes, there's always the, it's the most amazing teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like you, you heal, heal body, mind and spirit and healing the entire picture makes such a big difference versus just addressing the cause. Like most of the doctors do, you know, Oh, this is what's going on with you. They pick up the book, and it's all by the book actually. And um, and understanding doshas, like what you were saying, understanding we are all different. Right. We can't be eating all the same. We can't be doing having the same lifestyle. If maybe running is great for you, and but for me, it's it does the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So yeah, figuring all this out the hard way first. <laughs> exactly. Because we don't have a manual for us, you know, and that's what I kind of felt that I wanted to do is provide an owner's manual. So I do these deep immersion healing retreats with people that want to come and heal trauma and I give them a manual and I'm like, this is the owner's manual of how you can determine your own emotional way of being, your own mental constructs, like what's the Enneagram. I use all these tools for helping you identify and individualize all of those things that you're just talking about because we are not all the same. And you know, the way we do our science is so fascinating because we always think about like, oh, in, in an indigenous culture in you know, like in India or in Mexico or Peru, you know, mm -hmm. the, the natives used to use this plant for this purpose. So then we'll have our scientists take the plant and they look for the active ingredient. And then they take the active ingredient out and they make a synthetic form of that. And they don't realize that actually nature provides a synergistic quality to the entire ecosystem of the plant mm -hmm. and that all of it's important. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we always try to do that. And in our science, we do the same thing where we study one thing and we have to have it controlled and double blinded and random, you know, and what we don't understand is that then we can't take what the findings are from that study and extrapolate it to the entire population. And that's what we try to do. It's what Dean Ornish did when he was doing his work in the 1970s and 80s, and he found that fat was bad for your heart. He was probably studying a whole bunch of people that were coming to him with cardiac issues already. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, okay, I've noticed that if I put them on a very low fat diet, they respond really well and their heart disease is reversed. Well, now I do genetics on every one of my patients. Now we know there's a specific genetic SNP, an APOE4 gene, that probably his practice was full of those folks. And when you change that and you drop down their saturated fat for them, it's perfect. But for 90% of the rest of the population, actually fat is very good for us. And so, and then so now we're on the other side and we're saying, oh no. Keto is better for everybody, you know, lots of fat, healthy fats. And I'm like, no, those APOE4 people can't do that kind of fat. You know? <laughs> so it's like we keep trying to take one principle, one piece of a study and extrapolate it to 7 billion people that live on the planet. And it's, it's just like a wrong way of thinking. You know, we all have different fingerprints. The FBI knows we're all different. They can track us with our fingerprint. So why is it that medicine can't get that? <laughs> We're all different. <laughs> I love that you mentioned the indigenous people. They are so much more in touch with their bodies, with nature. So for them, it's so much easier also to find the right plant because they talk to the plants. They just right. they have such a different relationship with each other. It's all about community and, uh, and helping each other and survival. Right. And it makes me sad because we kind of lump indigenous cultures into one bucket. Like here's westernized and here's indigenous. And that's wrong too, because every one of those indigenous, tri you know, like Native Americans, every single tribe has its own belief systems, its own mores, its own values. You know, you can't just say Native American medicine, right? And you can't do it in Mexico, you can't do it in South America, you know, like they all have their own way of being, but we all put it in the same thing. 
And what's so interesting is that I take groups to Peru and I take groups to India and, you know, and I'm seeing so much of, um, oh, it makes me so sad. So much illness in these places now because, you know, a lot of the people that had this wisdom are walking around with cans of soda pop in their hands now, you know, and I just like, ah, stop it. You know, I, I work with plant medicine down in Peru and my teacher, uh, my shamanic teacher down there that I've worked with for the last 10 years, he actually has the plant medicine in a great big Inca cola bottle <laughs> when he pours it out. I'm like, ah, you know, so it's, it's so sad to me because, um, it, we're polluting like the entire planet with this stuff now. So <laughs> that was funny. That was interesting. I didn't think about that, but yes, you're, it's so true. I thought more of the, you know, of the, especially if it's a shaman using more the traditional bowls, using everything traditional. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Big two liter plastic bottle. <laughs> that used to have soda pop in it. Oh. Now it's got wachuma and, and I'm just like, oh, my little brain is warping right now. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. need to teach them too. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's the thing is, is being able to have that communication, it's not either or, it's, it's being able to blend what's great from both sides, right? And making something new, it's alchemy, mm -hmm. so yeah. I wanted to uh, ask you some questions and one is what is functional sexology so this is something else that you specialize I am the mother of functional sexology I invented it, <laughs> I so, love it. so when I <clears throat> when I had been in um, private practice for some time I'm an advanced registered nurse practitioner so in the state of Washington where I live, we can have our own, you know, primary care practices. So I would have women coming in and asking me for, um, for me to prescribe bioidentical hormone replacement. And they would say, and I gave a TED talk about this. It's called, have you heard from your libido lately? If you want to hear the in-depth version of that, but they would come in and they would say things like, um, my friend or my sister or my mother, or my daughter, you prescribed bioidentical hormones for her and she looks fabulous. She lost all this weight and she, she feels great. She can sleep. She has memory. Her libido is back. I want some of that, right? And I would say, okay, well, tell me why you think you need, you know, hormones. And <laughs> oftentimes it was because of libido. Um, I don't want to have sex and my, it's really affecting our relationship and my marriage. My husband's getting very frustrated and wants me to go get fixed, you know, go somewhere, get fixed, come back, have sex with me. I said, well, that really doesn't work very well. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I would ask questions like, so do you like this partner that's asking you to go get fixed, you know? And, and then oftentimes I would get people crying, you know, like spontaneous tears. And I would say, you know, I would wait and, and then they would say, you know, I have never told anybody this, but they, you know, my husband had an affair five years ago and we've gotten help. We've gone to therapy. I've forgiven him, but I, I've not wanted to have sex with him ever since. And I would say, you know, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are not going to help that. Right. And that's something completely different. And, or I would hear, I would ask the question, when was the last time, and when people want to lose weight, I ask this question in a different way. I always say, when's the last time you had a libido level you were happy with? Or if someone wants to lose weight, I'll say, when's the last time you had a body you were happy with? And when I hear never, I've never been happy with my body. I've never had a libido level. Well, then I know, you know, this again is not a hormonal issue. This is, this is something that's completely different. And so I started looking in, like, I'm, I'm a science geek, and so I start looking in the science to see if there's some kind of research that shows what I'm seeing in my office, and I found nothing, so I went back to school. I always say if I, in my office, if someone stumps the chump, then I go get more education, so I have a lot of education, and as you said in my intro, because I've had, I've been stumped a lot. <laughs> the chump has gotten stumped. <laughs> and so when I went back to school, I chose to do it in sexology, because what I was seeing is that this idea 
that there's a pill that can fix it, like Viagra can fix erectile dysfunction. Women had this idea that they could actually have that same pill that would fix low desire. And that's actually irrational because erectile dysfunction is a mechanical issue. You can see it, it's either up or it's down. With women, uh, what I began to understand in my doctoral research, I did a study called the Healing Unresolved Trauma Study. And as I was doing a review of the literature and, and looking at brain scans, I started understanding that women are very different from men. And on many, many levels, we actually have a different sexual desire and arousal mapping system. So Masters and Johnson produced the only mapping system for sexual arousal and desire that we had to date in the early 2000s. And what they did is they were studying prostitutes and they were studying men. And that was back in a time when it was revolutionary, the work that they did. It was remarkable. But what the what came out of it was something that can't be, once again, extrapolated into every bit of the population. Mm -hmm. So it's perfect for men. It shows that first there's desire, then there's arousal, and you can see it. Penis goes up, and then there's ejaculation, and then there's a refractory period as everything goes down. Women aren't like that. Some of them are. They follow that very linear pathway. Mm -hmm. But most women actually have different reasons for engaging sexually not just for pleasure. Um, oftentimes it's for emotional connection, it's for gatekeeping, it's for protection, of the, for, for power. They're, they're like a bunch of reasons, right? And also women don't have to feel desire before they engage sexually. And that myth perpetrates in our society, it's perpetuated by the media, by the idea that men are first of all always sexually on and that women uh, should be. And men are not always sexually on. And, you know, the idea that anyone should be anything is going to be irrational. So Rosemary Basson came out with a circular way of having sexual arousal and desire for women. And what it said, she's an OBGYN up in British Columbia. And she said, you know, like, women will come in for different reasons. And so then that means they don't have to be aroused or just have desire first. They can be aroused first and desire can follow. So I started doing work with um, really breaking this down and I started understanding what the root causes of low libido were and also reconceptualizing the very word libido. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking about why I started reconceptualizing it was the word ojas in Sanskrit from Ayurveda, which is life force vitality. And what, what they think about in Ayurveda is that you're born with a certain amount of ojas and when you burn through it, you die. That's how it works, right? And there are all kinds of reasons why each person has a different level of ojas. But I started thinking about life force vitality. We don't really have a word for that. Chinese have, have it, you know, Jin is their version, like all kinds of different ancient forms of medicine have an understanding of that, but we don't. And so I started using the word libido because what I started understanding was that libido, if we think about the word desire, desire is, a, is from a Latin word that means from the stars, Desiree. And from the stars means that actually that's like our life, our dharma, like what's our life mission? What's our life purpose? And it's also granted from the stars, from the cosmos, from God, depending on what your spiritual connection and vocabulary is, it's actually every female's birthright to feel pleasure, to be able to have the energy to live her life purpose and to have that be her mission in life. And so I started thinking about libido as like another vital sign, like an indicator light on a dashboard of a car. And I thought, gosh, if we're driving along our car, which is actually what our soul is doing inside our body, it's driving us along, right? And our, our body is just a vehicle to get where we need to go for our soul to have its evolution. And I thought if we are physically driving our car and we have an indicator light go off, like maybe the gas says it's um, empty, we don't just push down the gas pedal and expect to go further, farther, longer. We know we're going to break down. But that's 
doesn't happen for us ourselves when our body says E, we're waking up exhausted, we don't feel like our, our passion is gone for all of the things that used to bring us joy, we're depressed, we're anxious, all of these things, and then also low sexual desire are indicators that your life, life force vitality is ebbing. And so instead of grabbing coffee or an energy drink or a diet pill or sugar or whatever it is, right, to get you powered up, you actually need to listen to what is the body asking for for nourishment. And so I am board certified in functional medicine. And as I go to functional medicine conferences and I speak for the Institute for Functional Medicine and teach about this very thing. Mm -hmm. And as I'm on stages teaching this, I'm thinking, we now have branches of functional medicine that we call functional neurology and functional cardiology and functional pedi pediatrics. And I said, where is functional sexology? It's nowhere to be seen. We don't even talk about sexology. I've been in a little uh, negotiating debate for the last three years with IFM about this. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're starting to like, I actually taught a little webinar module to the functional medicine providers um, in April. That was a big win. And now we're, we're creating something. And you know, functional sexology is, the way I talk about it is it's finding and fixing whatever blocks that you have to your flow, the flow of your life force energy that keeps you on your life path doing what your Eastern philosophy would call your Dharma or your purpose. And so that's, if, if that's blocked, mother nature doesn't ever tolerate a block in her flow. You know, a volcano will erupt or <laughs> a tsunami will happen or an earthquake, you know, like we are that feminine energy. And so you need to not tolerate the blocks in your flow because otherwise you do erupt and it, you know, it's not pretty when it erupts sideways. And so this is a way of having some language for you to start identifying, Oh, I feel really blocked. I don't even know what my life purpose is. Oh my gosh. You know, and being able to begin that process of what Ayurvedic medicine would call digesting your emotions, being able to, if you've got grief that you need to grieve the loss of your 20 year old body, then you need to grieve that and then move forward into elderhood, you know, into the wise woman space of a body that holds a soul that is shinier and more luminous and can be seen, you know, more readily, unlike in the dewy youthful body of the 20 year old who you can barely see that because they don't have any wisdom yet. So there's, it's like being able to understand that this is the way that life is supposed to flow. So long answer. <laughs> that was wonderful. I was mesmerized. <laughs> because yes, libido is our life force. It's, and, and we always, and, and you know, having desire in life and having that, mm, yes, I want to do this, this little excitement, this butterflies in your tummy and feeling that, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, uh, you know, my, my seven-year-old asked me the other day, so mom, how, how did you know how to give birth and how did you know how to raise us? And I said, I don't know, you didn't come with a manual. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I just had to learn it. And he goes, does God give us manuals and you didn't get one? <laughs> <laughs> That's so beautiful. We yeah. actually do have manuals, but yeah. we just don't know how to read them. We need a Rosetta Stone, you know? The manual is actually the body. It's giving us so much information all the time. And it's not that difficult to read it. It's just our, our, our mother culture, the over culture that we live in, doesn't support taking time out to just be and to listen. It's all about productivity and achievement. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're not taking the time to connect in the way that mother nature provides all these different examples for us, you know, just the cycles of the seasons and day and night and looking at the shadow and the light and how it all comes together and flows together and wise people from generations of time all over the world have, and poets have pulled all this wisdom together because they've taken the time to actually observe have awareness, you know, and integrate.
but we're living in a very frenetic, I always say women today are trying to bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan and look hot at the same time. And we're not actually wired to keep that frenetic pace going all the time. And so there is bound to be a breakdown and that breakdown is a time that a breakthrough can occur if you'll allow it to. Otherwise, you're just gonna pop Xanax and keep moving, you know? And I'm not saying that that's bad or good, I'm just saying it is kind of the, the cultural currency right now. Um, I actually don't believe in bad and good, but I do believe that there are consequences to every action. And so if you suspend judgment out of the bad and good category and say, is this getting, is this the, getting me the life that I am really, really happy with? You know, am I learning the things, the skills that I believe that I'm here to learn? Then perfect. But if it's not, then each one of those moments of anxiety or those moments of wanting to reach for some kind of food to self-soothe mm -hmm. that is not life-sustaining, it's more life-destructive, all those unconscious patterns that have been created from a child brain, which worked back then but are not appropriate for today, now it's time to go reevaluate those. And so sometimes that needs to happen. I have a, um, in my book, Solving the Autoimmune Puzzle, I have a graphic that I love and it's a brain chasing its spinal cord around, like a dog chasing its tail. And so I have both of them, a dog chasing its tail and a brain chasing its spinal cord. And I always say like, the, the mind chases its tail, T-A-L-E, the same way a dog chases its T-A-I-L. And you can't expect the same mind that created the story to solve it. You know, sometimes you need to have a mentor, which is the Shiro's journey from Joseph Campbell, right? You need to have a mentor that will teach you a different way of seeing a pattern and then you can go start integrating it. But that takes a great deal of willingness to self confront. And that's what came out of my study, the hurt study developed the hurt model, which is illness, weight issues, you know, mood problems, all of them will perpetuate as long as you continue in a loop that does not have any self confrontation and it will just keep going and you'll go into diet after diet after diet and supplement after you'll spend hundreds thousands of dollars and you'll have the same outcome you have today or you can go over on the right hand side and you can say oh i need to self confront right now i need to really evaluate this and so and there's a way that i can do it i've got a whole structure around there and in my book solving the autoimmune puzzle it has worksheets you know like here's where you start Here's what you do next. If you're having trouble with this, here's what you do, you know? So. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, Dr. Keisha, is there one piece of advice that you can give the audience that they can implement in their life every day? Something maybe that, that you would do even every day. Is there a routine that you do just yeah. to stay balanced? I mean, you got four children. It doesn't matter if they're little or they're big, you know? I'm gonna give you two because two popped in my head when you said that. So I'm just gonna give you two. So the first one, because we talked about a couple of different things. So sexologically speaking, which you know, ladies, that's your that's your birthright, right? Mm -hmm. But I also tell women uh, to take your vagina to the gym, you know, every day because it's your your vaginal wall is a muscle and if you don't contract it against resistance you can just sit and do kegels all day long and it's just like going and going like this and hoping you're going to get a really good bicep you have to actually put a weight in this hand and then you can get a bicep right here same with your vagina if you don't want to be peeing every single time you run or hop or skip or jump or laugh or sneeze you know, stress urinary incontinence, then you want to actually do resistance training and a partner's penis or a sex toy. Um, there's a, something called the Kegel Master. Yoni balls don't work for people if they have prolapse already, but making sure that you're doing exercises against resistance vaginally every day. So I have sex every morning. And what that does is it helps me, like, I don't ever think do I have enough energy for this? You know, at the end, I sometimes I have it twice a day. So, you know, it just depends on what's been going on during the day. And so my, my husband and I don't, it's not even a discussion like, well, are you in the mood or do you want to get it on? Or do you want to, you know, like it's not even, it's just like, he'll say time to take Yoni to the gym. <laughs> 
it, it makes him very happy, of course. <laughs> it's a workout. I know, but it's it, but then I also am not like thinking of it as an energy drain, right? I think women do that a lot if they're the low desire partner in a in a relationship instead of the high desire partner for sex. And so they'll think of it as like, oh, one more thing someone's asking for me. So if you can think about it like, I don't always want to get up. Sometimes I'm up at four o'clock in the morning to go exercise. I don't always want to do that, you know, but I do know that I'm going to feel better afterwards and I'm going to um, have the energy that to do the rest of my, my daily uh, routine if I exercise. And so you know, I don't always want to have sex, but then I also know it's my exercise. So I'm going to put that out there. And then the second thing that I do every day is, uh, and I would encourage you to do this, is really watch your language. And I don't mean like shit, damn, and hell. I mean, like really watch how you speak to yourself. Do you speak to yourself as kindly and compassionately when you see yourself in the mirror? Um, do you go, wow, that car looks really great for the soul, you know, <laughs> or do you identify as your body is it and it's your self-worth and it's your self-esteem or do you see it as the vehicle for your soul? Like really listen to your language. Are you speaking kindly to it? Are you making sure that you're in a collaborative relationship, always negotiating? Oh, you don't want to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I hear that body. I've got you. We're going to, I'm going to put that off then so that you can get some more rest, right? And then I just know the consequence to that action will be that I probably won't on that day get in as long of a hike as I wanted to or whatever I had planned. And so I'll just put it to a different day and not judge it, not shame it, not feel guilty, right? It's just always in this beautiful collaborative conversation with your body. So self-love? Talk, talk nice to yourself and sex every day. There you go. And if you're single, and because sometimes I've had people hear me say that and they go, oh, I was really turned off by you bragging that you have sex every day. I was thinking, oh, that's so sweet. I certainly am not bragging about it. <laughs> I always know that whatever someone sees in me is a mirror of, of themselves. And I just felt compassion for her. And so I just want to like, make sure that you understand if you're single, there's a Kegel master, right? You don't have to have a partner. So, and it's, it's not about that. It's really about making sure your vagina gets exercise. It's just another part of your body that really needs some attention also and some love. Yes. So. Thank you for addressing that part because there's not many people that like to talk about this, especially on, on video, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Keisha, for your valuable information to the world and just spending this wonderful time together. I so appreciate you. Oh, it's so much my pleasure. Thank you for creating this platform so that people can find themselves and be authentic. One last thing is 50% of the world, half of the world will not like you. So you may as well just be your authentic self so that the tribe that does like you will want to keep you. <laughs> Great advice. And can you uh, talk a little bit about the free gift that the, the audience can download? Yeah, so we uh, put together a 21-day quick start program. My team came to me and they said, you know, we get a lot of email after you do a summit about, you know, people wanting to really access, like, how do I get started with this? So I did these 21 emails, which do doesn't sound like a really beautiful gift because it's like, oh my gosh, you're going to flood my inbox. But actually, it's 21 days of very easy, very, because I am the busiest person that I know, and, and I need things to be efficient and easy. And so it's from all the Pancha Koshas, like five different layers, little tiny things you can do to make sure that those are balanced and detoxed and clear so that you can access that collective unconsciousness, so that your body will be in a balanced state, and your mind will be in a balanced state, and your emotions will be in a balanced state. And so it's 21 different, very easy, subtle things that you can start implementing into your world. Thank you. Thank you. That's very generous. So everyone just download um, the, the gift and you can get a hold of Dr. Keisha. I will put her email down and all her information. And thank you again so much for being here today. Thank you.